So uh, can you guys hear me clearly? All right, so good morning and welcome to the Competitive Strategy uh, IG Business Meeting. I'm PK, I'm the IG Chair, and together with uh, our Program Chair, Tomas, and Associate Program Chair, uh, Jada, we have put together what we hope is an exciting uh, program for today's business meeting. Right. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, first, we'll quickly introduce the officers uh, of this IG, and then Jada will talk a little bit about the pre-conference program uh, this year, and followed by Tomas will give us more details about the main uh, conference program itself. So usually the business meeting happens uh, towards the end of the SMS conference. So this year is a little bit different. <clears throat> so this year we have the advantage of being able to hold this business meeting at the beginning of the, before the conference even begins. So we have a chance to promote to you what are the different exciting things we've lined up uh, from this IG and hopefully encourage you to attend some, if not all of them, right? And then also we have two new things uh, that's happening this year uh, during the business meeting itself. First is for the first time, the CSIG, Competitive Strategy IG, will be giving out uh, best, two best proposal awards. Uh, we have a strong list of uh, finalists lineup and we'll be announcing the, the winners shortly. And second, uh, we're going to have, uh, we're very honored to have two senior scholars with us today, Connie Helfart and Gautam Afuja. Thank you for coming. Um, so they're going to have a discussion, a conversation about the future of competitive research, uh, competitive strategy research. So uh, usually, this is all the business meetings I've ever attended so far. They're always about administrative issues, about memberships, about proposals, submissions, uh, acceptance rates, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But the three of us, meaning me, myself, uh, Tomas, and Jada, uh, we thought, why should, that, why should that be the case, right? So surely uh, the substantive mission of, what, uh, of this IG and the research that pertains to this IG should be brought to the forefront as well and to be discussed. So we uh, thought it might be good for, the, uh, for our members to have a sense of where research is going, a research that, that again pertains to the core of this IG. So we are very excited to hear what our two panelists, senior panelists have to say on this. Yeah. So very quickly, uh, we'll try to go through the first part quickly, the administrative part quickly, so as to save more time for the discussion towards the second half of this uh, event. Okay, very quickly, I'm the IG chair, I'm PK and uh, the outgoing IG chair <clears throat> and program chair is Tomas uh, Obloch from, I should say, Paris. Associate program chair is Jada Di Stefano from uh, Bocconi. And we have six representatives that's representing this uh, uh, IG. Victor Burnett from Duke, Caroline Flammer from Boston University, Ram Ranganathan from UT Austin, Nanjia from USC, Charlotte Wren from Temple, and Marchik Last name, I would be slaughtering it, so I would rather not try it. <laughs> Magic from Essex, right? So the names with the asterisks uh, are outgoing, uh, and the names without the asterisk are continuing uh, leaders of this IG. And the, we will soon have elections so, uh, coming up, and we will encourage uh, everyone to participate and, and uh, vote actively in it. Right? So next, we'll have Jada to tell us a little bit about the pre-conference program. Yes, so hi everyone and uh, welcome to our meeting. Uh, so um, let me tell you a little bit what we have organized uh, for the IG from the week, for the week that goes from Monday, October 19th up until Saturday, October 24th. One of the advantages of running an online program is that we were actually able to schedule uh, many activities in a way that makes them, uh, makes attendance uh, to each one of them compatible uh, with each other. So what we want to present to you is a little bit of the schedule that we have and you will see in total we have a career development workshop uh, targeting uh, junior scholars, a paper development workshop. These two workshops actually uh, require the registration and the registration deadline has already passed. But we can focus on the following five, so two method-oriented workshops and three panel sessions that actually do not require registration, hence uh, you can all participate in each one of them. So next slide, let's look at the schedule. 
what we see here is uh, what is going to happen over four days uh, with the five uh, activities that do not require uh, registration in advance. So you will see we'll start on Monday, October 19, uh, with a panel on uh, Beyond Does It Pay to Be Green, Exploring Firms Environmental Strategies. Uh, it's a panel that has been put together by Jean-Jacques Minet from Bocconi, and you can see that it has a, an amazing lineup of speakers who are going to engage with this topic. Moving forward to Tuesday, October 20th, we'll start with the field experiments in strategy, challenges and promises. This, uh, this is a hands-on workshop organized by Eugene Kim and Rem Koning. And uh, um, again, uh, we have an amazing set of speakers who are going to tell us about uh, uh, the challenges and promises of this method and uh, potentially give suggestions on how to improve it uh, with respect to your own project. Um, at uh, 1.30, uh, we start uh, with the usual uh, method-oriented panel uh, of our Sunday sessions. So this year, um, the panel is organized by Evan Starr from the University of Maryland, uh, and uh, it deals with the question-driven research. Uh, four speakers, among whom uh, um, myself, uh, are going to give uh, their perspective on this topic. Uh, we leave you free on Wednesday, and then uh, we come back on Thursday, October 22nd, uh, with a conversation on rediscovering the importance of strategic choices, uh, led by Ariana Marchetti from London Business School, uh, with three uh, guests uh, who are going to engage in a conversation about that. And we conclude on Friday, October 23rd, uh, with um, a, a panel, uh, a workshop uh, on developing and publishing formal models uh, in strategic management research organized by and with the participation of many uh, different scholars who are all uh, joining uh, um, their forces uh, to organize uh, the pan this panel together. Um, and this promises to be all uh, both uh, uh, these panels and on the panel, uh, the different sessions, uh, I think promise to be very interesting at the forefront of what we think are relevant topics in uh, um, competitive strategy nowadays. So um, we hope you will make uh, time on your uh, schedules uh, to make sure that you can actually participate in all of them. Then we have uh, two workshops that uh, um, are uh, targeting the junior scholars uh, and uh, um, um, basically all the community. So let's start with the junior scholars. Uh, this is our career development workshop. It is an annual uh, uh, appointment that uh, we have. It's organized by two of our reps at large, Caroline and uh, Maciej. And uh, it's going to be held on uh, October 24th. Um, and it deals with the how do letter writers read and evaluate your tenure package. So very practical um, implications uh, for all the junior scholars out there. And then finally, we are going to conclude uh, with the paper development workshop. Uh, this is organized uh, together with uh, other um, IGs, uh, in particular sponsored to get by Com Cooperative Strategy, Competitive Strategy, Corporate Strategy, Entrepreneurship and Strategy, and Non-Learning really Engine Innovation. Uh, on our side, uh, Ram and Nan are uh, the two officers uh, in charge of uh, organizing the workshop. And also here, um, you can see that uh, the, the, the topic deals with the um, topic of our conference this year. Uh, but the outcome of this workshop is basically to help uh, you better develop your papers. This is also registration based. So that's it on my side. Let's uh, pass it to Tomasz, who's going to tell you more about the competitive program. Thank you. So just like the pre-conference program, uh, the same goes for the competitive program, meaning that it's more spread out in time than it, uh, than it usually is. So we start on Monday the 26th and we go all the way uh, up until Friday the 30th. Um, this year, as you'll see, we've had one of the most competitive historically um, acceptance rate to the conference and the result uh, was uh, 40 accepted proposals that, uh, that are grouped into 12 uh, sessions. So as you can see by the numbers here, again, we don't have the data for, bef for before uh, 2014. Uh, but I think that historically this is the most most competitive year in terms of in terms of acceptance rate. So also the the quality of the of the proposals. It was a pleasure to uh, to work with them, and also um, just like with the co competitive advantage workshop that Giada just uh, 
uh, just described, we have many sessions, so five out of 12 are co-sponsored with different IGs uh, from, uh, from, from SMS. So again, I think that this is what we would want going forward, would want to, uh, to see more and more of is, is creating those sessions that fit better topic-wise, uh, but not necessarily from the, pro the proposals that were submitted to and accepted in our IG. So I think that with other IGs, we've managed to put together some of the sessions that, that really fit together, but it wouldn't have been possible if, if we didn't, uh, didn't reach out to, to create those, those joint sessions. Um, so again, also from the numbers, I would want to, many of you are, are, are here, are, were reviewers. As you can see, we've also hit the record number of reviewers this year with 220. Thank you very much. This really facilitated, uh, facilitated our, our lives. And also, I think uh, we had a chance to give very high quality feedback to, the, to those who submitted the proposals, even if they didn't ultimately get, get accepted, which is, which is also great for most of the proposals we were actually able to give uh, feedback from three different reviewers. Uh, so that was great. And so now for the first time this year, the, our interest group um, is giving away awards. Uh, so we've decided to, uh, to, to award the most creative proposal and the, the proposal that we thought really stood out in terms of, in terms of rigor. Just full, for full transparency in terms of process, we relied on the, from among 40 accepted proposals, we relied on the assessment of the competitive program reviewers to select a short list of 12 proposals. And then we've blinded those proposals and IG leadership reviewed and ranked them. And based on this ranking, uh, we have selected three, um, three finalists for each of the uh, each of the each of the award and then of course uh, of course the the ultimate recipient of the award um, we are also creating our ig's uh, youtube channel so we're still figuring out figuring out whether it will be a standalone channel or it will be part of the part of the sms channel we've asked all the finalists to send us a very short video description of their proposal uh, so those uh, those descriptions will be will be will be available uh, shortly after our our uh, our, uh, our business meeting. So if you're interested in learning more about those proposals, you'll be able to uh, to see them uh, see the authors video themselves and talk to us about what they have done. So the first award is the uh, is the award for uh, creativity and research, <clears throat> and we have uh, three great proposals here. Uh, Hyunjin Kim with the value of competitor innovation, information, sorry, evidence from a field experiment. Daniel Sands, the role of third parties in value creation and capture. And Manaf Raj, friends in high places, indirect network effects and competition on platform markets. And -da 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 -da, the award uh, for the uh, most creative proposal submitted to the competitive strategy interest group uh, goes to Hyunjin Kim for the value of competitor information, uh, evidence from the field experiment. And uh, the second award, I feel like with this is a silence, it's a bit awkward, but the, the second, uh, the second, our second award is for rigor in research. And here we've, uh, you can see that Hyunjin Kim's proposal was actually selected as a finalist in both categories. So this is also a um, some more mark of, uh, of 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 how how well this proposal was assessed by the by the reviewers. The second uh, proposal, who is a defined that is a finalist in this in this category, uh, is a proposal by Emily Feldman and James McLynch on transition uh, TSAs and corporate spin-offs. And the final proposal is by Alex Wong and Nandini Rayagopalan. Uh, Lori Yu and Brian Wu, acquisitions and entries in platform market. And uh, we have uh, decided to uh, give the award for the, uh, for the proposal award for rigor and research uh, to acquisitions and entries in platform market. Uh, so congratulations. Well done. And uh, my role ends here and I'll give it over back to PK. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so we're doing really well on time. All right, so we've gone through, we've gone through that in 15 minutes, uh, what we uh, usually take an hour to do. So that's fantastic. So for the remaining four, uh, 45 minutes, uh, let's have a discussion uh, about the future of competitive strategy research. Uh, as I said in the beginning of the meeting, we're very excited to hear from uh, two senior scholars, Connie Helfart and Gautam Afuja. 
So broadly, the idea is to give, give us a sense of, you know, where is this going, right? Where's this uh, competitive research, competitive strategy research, where is it going? So one can almost uh, make a strong statement by saying that there should be no strategy without competition. Uh, yet, uh, in, in the strategy research that we see today, uh, we don't necessarily see competition being featured front and center. Right? So, uh, but yet all of us are, are, are in this IG. So definitely we're, we're interested in how, what is the role of competition? Uh, what does it play in, in the way firms strategize? So, uh, so we would like to hear a little bit about, you know, what's the future going forward? What does it look like in terms of competitive research? So, uh, so let's do this. Uh, maybe we'll let Connie go first uh, for about 10, 15 minutes, followed by Gautam for another 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll open up uh, the floor for discussions. Connie? All right. Hey, it's great to see you guys. I know a bunch of you, some of you I don't know, so it's nice to meet you uh, virtually. <laughs> Uh, I think what I'll do, since we don't have a huge group, is I'll talk for a little while. I'm trying to keep it to under 10 minutes. I have some notes and maybe set the stage. I hope I don't say everything Gautam was going to say. Um, and then and then after the two of us are done, maybe we'll have a little more time just to hear what you think, you know, reactions to what we say, you know, whatever. So I'll try not to take my full 10 minutes. Um, so first of all, PKS sort of like if we would, talk about three questions. So the first one, what's the role of competition in strategy research? So I thought I'd step back and, and think about when the SMS first set up IGs. You know, they didn't have them for a long time and they set them up. And the two big ones were competitive strategy and corporate strategy, right? In fact, maybe there were a couple others, but those are the ones people remember. Why? So competitive strategy was single business strategic issues broadly defined and corporate strategy was multi-business broadly defined right so okay so over the years we've had a, what I, you know a lot of igs added and some of you know and they cross competitive and corporate strategy there's some sort of topic areas right you know um and um or ways approaches you know strategy process behavioral there's that and then there's topic areas like i think there's I don't know what they call the sustainability one. Or knowledge and innovation was an early one. So you think, well, what's the role of this IG, right? I still think it's business level strategy, honestly. Um, and if you see a lot of the proposals, that's what you've got. But this issue of competition is right there, right? Because competitive strategy is about, you know, thinking about competition from a strategic point of view, broadly defined. Um, so, um, if competition is at the business level, which is correct, right? Competition takes place in markets. Um, you know, that doesn't mean a single market necessarily. It can mean multi-market competition, which has been a fairly big stream. Uh, so that actually gets you into some issues of corporate strategy, right? Because you have to think about how to manage competition in multiple markets. So I mentioned that just to tell you there's not a clean definition here. Um, but having said that, when we think about competition in a market, you can think about competition on the output side, which is a traditional distinction, or competition on the input side, which doesn't get as much attention, right? And there has been some work on that, but I really think we could think more about that. You know, the resource-based view, dynamic capabilities, yeah, that's all focused on the input side. But you know, if you don't think about competition, you're really not going to get the full answer of, of who succeeds and who doesn't. And the research-based view implicitly has competition in it. You know, the first criterion is resources need to be rare, right? And that that's relative to your competition. So I think that that's something to think about. Um, when we think about topics, you know, what's the role? You know, it's all the traditional IO stuff, you know, oligopoly market theory, um, you know, using game theory. There's, um, there's topics like first mover advantage, entry and exit, in addition to sort of competitive moves. Once you get into competitive moves, quite honestly, that's anything, right? That's M&A. That's <laughs> any move you could take that might affect your competitors. So first thing I would point out is this is actually really broad, all right? This is not some little narrow topic area. Um, it's just the way you're thinking about it is with respect to your competitors, because there are other ways to think about these topics that are more sort of internally focused. Um, the other thing I would mention is that um, 
you know, there's an older literature and strategy on competitive dynamics that does resurface. There was a nice, uh, I think, annals piece like in 2017 by Ming Jir Chen and somebody else. And that take that literature has more behavioral aspects to it, which I think people forget because competitive dynamics is about going, you know, back and forth between competitors. And it, it merges sort of traditional strategy with IO econ with some behavioral stuff. So I actually think that that's, that's a, we might want to go back to that, right? Not the way necessarily that research was done, but go back to that idea and think more about it. Um, okay, so then the, the next thing PKS is, is this role changing. Um, well, so I think the big change in recent years is to use the value-based strategy, right? You know, the Brandenburger and Stewart stuff with the value creation co opetition which brings in the, not only competition, but cooperating at the same time. You know, there's an awful, to my impression is there's an awful lot more theoretical work on this than empirical work. So I think there's sort of a need for more empirical work. I also think that the, that work tends to be more mathematical than other theoretical research and strategy. Um, and I think that that's helpful. Uh, but I think there's a translational issue here that, you know, not everyone's tooled up on the math of cooperative game theory. And so I do think that, you know, it would be really helpful to have more translational research to reach the rest of the field. Because if you want empirical research, people need to understand the nuances of this. Um, so I, I think that that would actually be helpful. I think alongside that, you are seeing more of a shift to mathematical modeling in general particularly for competition. I think that's all beneficial. I do think we could see a little less emphasis on equilibrium, <laughs> a little more emphasis on change. You know, I mean, we're in, we're in the business of understanding change, all right? To, this is not interesting if everything stays the same, right? We would have no, we have, we'd be out of a job, okay? You know, so you know, yes, you can use equilibrium modeling to deal with change, but I think we do need to think about disequilibrium more. Um, so I, I think that's the, I like the precision that mathematical modeling brings you, but you can do mathematical modeling of different types like simulations, more evolutionary modeling that doesn't require strict equilibrium assumptions. So I would also suggest moving in that direction. Um, and then finally, uh, just in terms of sort of PKS future directions for research incorporating the study of competition. I have a few notes. First of all, I think what's happening today is where you see a lot of this is in the work on platforms, right? I mean, um, mathematical models, case studies, some empirical work, um, Fang Zhu, uh, Rob Siemens, with a whole bunch of others. Um, I think that, you know, there's theory and empirics. Uh, it's, between platform leaders, between complementers on a platform, complementers who are going to overtake leaders and become their own platform leaders. That's, I think that's a big area. If I look at where it's the competition research. And then I think it's in all the traditional areas. It's thinking about competition and innovation. So PK's got work there. We could think more about mergers and acquisitions and competition, which I actually think would be helpful because there's an awful lot of work on m and A. I don't see that much on competition front and center in that work. Um, I think um, it would be really helpful to think more about CSR and competition. I've seen a couple papers come through on that, but you know that's a big topic area, broadly defined, sustainability, whatever. And I think competition sort of it could use more emphasis. What's the role of this um, in CSR decisions? And um, finally, um, I well, two more things. I think we could think more about behavioral strategy and competition. Those folks have been more focused on sort of decision-making processes, more internal. And I think that if this matters, it ought to affect competition. So I think that, I think there are a lot of touch points with the other divisions that you know, would be really good to exploit. I've mentioned some. Um, and uh, I also think that, um, and, and all right, another touch point would be um, with corporate strategy, not just multi-market competition, but there's a recent paper in SMJ on product market competition and resource redeployment, right? So resource redeployment is across markets, 
how does product competition in one market affect your redeployment in another? That's actually a big reason why firms redeploy, right? So that is, there are touch points between competition and corporate strategy. So I'm just giving you a laundry list. The last thing I'll say, and I'll turn it over to Gautam, is I think we need to think more about public policy. And I, I know Gautam agrees with me. I mean, this is kind of a broken record, but think about antitrust policy, right? The economists have no good way of thinking about potential competition, right? Because they refuse to consider it. But my favorite example is Facebook acquiring Instagram. Anybody who knew that market at the time would have told you this was the worst idea on this planet, right? Instagram was growing like gangbusters. Everybody could see the uptake. They were gonna be a competitor to Facebook. However, they had a small market share at the time, so the authorities let them take over, Facebook take over Instagram. This is just one place where I think strategy could have much more impact. Um, and antitrust is a big area where public policy and competition come together. Okay, so I've been talking fast. Hopefully I've just given you lots of ideas um, and I'm done. Thank you, Dalton. Sure, uh, uh, Connie, thank you for that wonderful uh, uh, synthesis. Actually, you touched upon several of the things that I had kind of not formulated as, as, as nicely, but I'm going to come up with a couple of, uh, you know, sort of reactions to some of the things that you mentioned. And uh, before that, I, I will begin by saying that, you know, PK's first question, is there a decline in comparative strategy uh, sort of uh, research? Uh, my perception is that its relative market share has probably gone down, but I would uh, really like to hear from Connie because my perception is very sharply driven by my org science, you know, role, where uh, almost by definition of, you know, by the scope of the journal, many of the people who would be working on those kinds of areas don't necessarily think of org science as the as the place to go first, whereas Connie is front and center in that uh, in that space. So that's at least one thing that she might actually be able to give us a better uh, a better feel for. But I do feel that it is under, you know you sort of underemphasized at some level just from my, you know, watching the, what is getting published uh, across the field. The second thing I'm wondering is, and I think Connie touched upon this, is, uh, you know, the resource-based view, as she pointed out, competition is front and center in it. But I wonder that because the resource-based view has been so dominant now, or at least has been on an up path for like, you know, a, a decade or more, uh, and it focuses a lot on factor market stuff. Maybe that is, uh, in a sense, uh, causing people to be less, you know, sort of, uh, we, we know that research follows a local search trajectory. If something, somebody does one thing, then lots of people build around that. And uh, maybe one of the things that is there is that people sort of need to be reminded that really this is about competition, as, as Connie pointed out. But uh, just because we're looking into the factor markets doesn't mean that the product markets are not, you know, eventually the, the place where a lot of the action is. So I think that both of these things she can probably uh, speak to better than me. Uh, in terms of my own thoughts on the issue, I my take and the reason why I think uh, this is an underemphasized arena uh, right now, comparative strategy, because I see three very distinct triggers which suggests to me that this should be sort of the golden age of, of uh, comparative analysis and, and comparative strategy. Uh, first of all is technology. I think in our lifetimes, we have not seen such a dramatic expl explosion of digitization and related technologies. And if you think about, uh, and I'll get to that in, in, in a few minutes, uh, the, the entire space on which we you know, conduct co comparative strategy research is actually opened up for, for business again, not that it was ever closed, but metaphorically speaking, the, there's a lot that could be done. And I'll take one illustration and, and sort of flesh this, this idea out. The second part is uh, a lot of the comparative strategy research was done at a time with far more primitive econometric uh, approaches. I, I'm not sure primitive, but they necessarily primitive. They were different. And now we have these this new toolkit from, ranging from field experiments to uh, you know, lab experiments to, uh, you know, a whole bunch of uh, uh, techniques which can help us be a little bit more comfortable out, about causality. I don't think anything finally establishes causality that clearly that we are, uh, you know, uh, confident of it. 
but it is nevertheless another way to to subject our ideas to to rigor and, and that's that should you know there's some value to redoing most of the stuff we've done uh, and the third part is what i call digitization in real life uh, we now have digital traces of what everybody seems to be doing whether it's companies or individuals and uh, the this allows us to examine things that we never knew or could and just to give you one illustration of that a lot of the research in comparative strategy in the past was focused on the cost side okay so the issue there was that costs are very measurable we look for data and that's you know pretty much where the data are okay uh, and so even though you know uh, ron and dan and others uh, came up with some wonderful work in the area of the demand side of things we have never really had a very good way of, of looking at willingness to pay in a quantitative fashion right but now you have things like uh, you know all this digital traces which enable you to see not just the choice that was made but also the choices that were considered right and now the thing is you got to open these boxes somehow and get access from you know from companies and so on but there's enough creativity in the field to figure that out what that tells us is that we can start looking at mapping preference structures see that's a missing arena in comparative strategy for most of the time because we we never had the opportunity to do that even if you look at the five forces there's no place where they actually account for the preference structure of customers in a very direct fashion i mean it's implicitly there and uh, one of the reasons the old io research also didn't really go that deeply into it there were a few papers which you know uh, looked at uh, things like uh, serials etc but now we have an incredible space of possibilities here so i think that entire you know fleshing out the willingness to pay side of our uh, comparative strategy that's a big space both conceptually and empirically uh, you know in terms of its potential now uh, i i'll just say one more thing and you know which is that how what was i i'll try and flesh out the idea of technology essentially uh, how you could take one topic and see what technology does to it and that opens up so many questions that uh, you know I, i i wish i did not have all my other commitments and and including my existing research projects that i need to finish uh, and get to those see if you think about competitive advantage which in some sense is one of the core constructs of comp uh, competitive strategy there are five common sources of competitive advantage economies of scale economies of scope accumulated investments preemptive investments and ex efficiency okay Uh, both all five of these have a cost dimension and a willingness to pay dimension so for instance connie mentioned the network effect side is the you know the scale on the on the on the willingness to pay side similarly you have willingness to pay synergies which operate on the uh, willingness to pay side of economies of scope etc but work in the past you know we study what is available and the old world was very much driven the physical world was very much driven by cost side stuff both in terms of data availability as well as the importance of the phenomenon but a lot of the new economy is driven by willingness to pay side stuff i mean it's very difficult to argue that many of the of the scope of many firms and i know i'm i'm sort of stepping into corporate strategy here but uh, the that line is is now very very you know as uh, connie also pointed out that line is is now becoming very very um, you know blurry Uh, it's difficult to explain a lot of those things based on you know uh, purely cost side economies of scope similarly we did the accumulated investment stuff in the form of experience curves in the past and uh, that was wonderful you have you know this incredible work by linda and and uh, marvin and others uh, but all of it was based on physical manufacturing settings today with artificial intelligence and uh, you know things like that uh, there's a huge story and incredible data available on uh, looking at how accumulated investments in the form of algorithm expertise and volume of transactions through them is creating a, a differential in terms of competitive uh, advantages which is very difficult to catch up and which is exactly the kind of thing that Connie was referring to when she said we need to think about the antitrust implications of it the reality is that today google's uh algorithms for self driven cars and that's why you see all the litigation about people trying to steal the stuff is that there is an incredible volume advantage that google already has so think of all the complex processes in the world uh, that could be mapped through the through the use of digital data uh 
The interesting thing is experience curve effects were usually studied in the old world for repetitive uh, manufacturing type processes, right? Now we're saying, well, artificial intelligence and machine learning give us the ability to expand the scope of this incredibly. So you basically look at companies like, uh, you know, like if you look at context like driving, okay? Driving is full of randomness usually the worst possible place for any experience curve effect, right? In, 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 in terms of a uh, research approach, because we would never be able to get the volume of transactions required to parameterize the, the actual, you know, the benefits. But now we know that the single biggest predictor of uh, an automated algorithm for driving, uh, whether it's, you know, it's success is simply a function of the number of miles you've driven. I mean, you don't have to have a very long regression. That one, predictor and you're in, you know, you're, you're kind of through. So, and, and now you can imagine how many different processes of that kind can be opened up and, uh, you know, uh, played with. So there is an incredible amount of, of possibility we have touched upon. So if you think of this, I'm really talking about a grid with 10 boxes. You have the five sources of competitive advantage on the left-hand side, and then you have the two columns. One is the cost side and the willingness to pay side. The cost side is what we've explored in the old world extensively, and it's probably worth re-exploring. The willingness to pay side is Connie pointed out on the ecosystems part, we have you know, gotten into it, perhaps not as much as we could. And especially using the, the approach that Connie is mentioning, which is you know, a non-equilibrium approach because a lot of these markets are constantly dynamic and, and even understanding how competition plays out yet is not, uh, you know, is not kind of uh, you know, possible. And looking into the future, I mean, we don't even have the apparatus. I mean, the economists, as, as Connie pointed out, don't, but even we could do a lot more in that arena. So I think her, her process approach is really something that resonated with me. And, and all of those five boxes on the willingness to pay side are really open for, for business. So uh, I'll stop here, but I'll say that, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, the issues that were uh, sort of, uh, you know, and this is just one topic. You could go to the other one that sort of Connie drew attention to, which was value-based business strategy. That has an incredible amount of, you know, you know, potential. But again, uh, I agree fully with her assessment. That's you got to push there, and uh, maybe modeling is the way to go. And uh, maybe some empirical work would also be nice. There's hardly uh, any of that around. So I'll stop here. But but uh, in a sense, I think Connie kind of teed it up very nicely because it was uh, simply those are the strains, and I and I don't think I I, I disagree with that. She probably has a better sense and can react to my you know, earlier comments on um, the resource-based view kind of crowding out the product market competition story or what she sees in her role as uh, you know, SMJ editor on uh, the relative, uh, you know, is there a downward trend? I can't observe that trend because you know, there's a huge selection bias in what I see. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both uh, Connie and Gautam for very interesting thoughts. Um, so let's open up for discussions. So, uh, feel free to raise your hands. I'll try to regulate as much as I can, as best as I can. Do you want me to try and answer Gautam's yes, question? Yeah, sure. Yes, um, so I actually went through the last few issues, you know, like half a year of SMJ, because I had this impression that maybe research on competition was low. And I'd say about 20% of the papers are front and center about competition, which is actually, if you ask me, fairly high. All right. Um, you know, I, I haven't gone through old issues of SMJ, but I don't think half of them were about competition. In fact, I think a lot of them were internally focused. So I, I think part of this is perception. That's my first point. All right. You know, um, Gotham asked me something else. I don't remember what it was, but anyway, um, that, that's the main thing I was going to say. In a sense, uh, Connie, it, it kind of, you, by correcting my misperception, and I thought it, I was bi biased anyway, because of, you know, you know how it is, if you're seeing like uh, 1500 manuscripts of one kind, your world is, is never going to be the same again. So, but the point I was making is that perhaps as the resource-based view has sort of uh, become a powerful lens, people may have possibly, this is just a, this is just a complete conjecture, people may have focused more on factor markets and not as much on visible product market competition, though, as you pointed out in your original statement, that is very much a part of the story. So maybe I was thinking that that might have done it, but to the extent that you are seeing these, these numbers or these proportions, I, I don't even know if that's valid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, let's open up for questions. Raise your hands if you have questions so I can see, so I can see it. Uh, maybe I'll start, right? So, so it's, Connie, it's, it's heartening to hear that, you know, there's still a lot of uh, research in SMJ that's, that's focusing on competition. I guess where I was going, uh, why did I ask the question in the email sent to you guys? Um, so like you said, you know, competition is prevalent in almost all topics in strategy and uh, uh, anything, is any issues that we study across the different areas, different contexts can be framed, uh, can be thought through the competitive lens. And as Connie was saying, you know, now there's a lot of action in platform ecosystems. And as Gautam is saying, now we have a lot of techniques for us to uncover a lot more details uh, that, that points more to the kind of the competitive behavior, uh, what's fun, fundamental to competitive behavior. I guess where, what I'm asking is, um, okay, so everything is competition, but is there a particular framework, concept, or question or issue that pertains to competitive strategy uniquely? Right. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Any thoughts on that? Piki, can you clarify your question? I'm not sure I fully got it. There was a little dip in between that, maybe because of my internet and I, and I missed that. So just the short version of the question. Yeah, so the short version is, is there, is there a concept or framework or question that is unique to competitive strategy. Um, you know, I mean, I, I would argue. I mean, in a, I'm sure that your question has more to it uh, than uh, than I'm picking up on. But uh, you can think of concept, framework, and uh, uh, you know, uh, process. All of them. Yes, there are some things that are what I would think of as square and uniquely. You know. Uh, this thing so market attractiveness for instance uh you know whether we do five forces or value net or any of these things is very much a central competitive strategy construct sources a competitive advantage yes it leads into economies of scope part leads into multi-business firms but the other four sources are very often about uh, you know just the uh, just a single business strategy in that and that's how we teach it right when we go and teach a case uh, we don't talk about, you know, say on Coca-Cola, we don't talk about all the other, you know, businesses they're in. We only talk about the, the soft drink business and so on. So uh, there are definitely, uh, you know, business strategy uh, specific concepts here, but, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the, the uh, value-based business strategy, again, the whole construct is around. In fact, that's even lower at the level, you know, it's even sharper than that or narrower than that. It's look at a, looks at a firm and all the, things it plays with or a business and all the things it plays with uh, without even stopping to define an industry. So my take is that uh, the answer would be yes. But yeah, maybe Connie has a yeah, different perspective. Yeah. Um, sorry, so Gal gave a better answer than I could. I mean, I was thinking it's, I think of, of competitive strategy is you can look at so many topics with multiple lenses. Right, I can look at M&A and look at the decision making at the top, right? What are the cognitive influences? I can look at M&A and think about the resources. I can look at post, you know, merger integration. From a competitive strategy point of view, it's it, M&A is a competitive move to try and get some advantage over your competitors, right? So asking that direct question is what does it do to competition either in the input market or in the output market? And what are the implications of that for competitive advantage, right? So it's the type of question you ask. I don't think it's, you know, you can even look at things like willingness to pay from a corporate strategy point of view, right? How do you, you know, use relationships to, you know, get economies of scope, you know, raise willingness to pay, right? That's not a competition thing, right? So it's the question you ask about the particular phenomenon or thing you're studying. And the question is directly focused on a role of competition with other firms. And that's how I think of it. So that's a very broad, right? It doesn't give you a nice, you know, neat, all right, here's, here's competitive strategy. Um, 
We have a question from Christina. Hi, yes. Uh, I'm going to say good morning because that's where it is here. Um, so, so as many of you know, I do empirical work and I do it with these large data sets. And the challenge I often find is how to be nuanced about um, considering competition in the data. Because on the one hand, we have from, you know, Chad Severson and Concrete and this just tremendous you know, detailed work to di define a product market. On the other hand, we just grab a, a you know, an industry code and kind of count up how many people are in it. And, um, you know, practically speaking, neither one of those is very operational for the, for the average paper. And, and I don't know if you have a perspective on, you know, some examples of papers that have done this well or new considerations we could bring to bear um, on that undertaking, because this is sort of consuming my life right now. Um, I, I don't have any great ideas. Uh, I'll tell you, I've been thinking about this, probably because, you know, I, I actually serve as an editor on papers at SMJ beside everything else, and some of them lately, a couple of them have ended up dealing implicitly with competition or explicitly and the management issues are so difficult um a you talk about trying to define who your competitors are right i mean it needs very granular data to do this right i actually think if you were going to do this right what you would do is not start with the market because it's hard to find start with a firm like Gautham was saying right and then say who who are the firm's competitors now and maybe in the future, which may in fact not be a traditional market, right? Um, but that's a, that's a different point of view than trying to say, what does competition look like in some market, right? Um, so that, that's one approach. The other issue is if you're gonna take a market perspective, our measure, it's hard to even get data on traditional measures like a Herfindahl index. Um, you know, I've seen people use just a count of competitors, which is sometimes the best you can do. Um, but, um, so I don't have a good answer. The SIC codes are like terrible. The data are, are terrible, right? Because it's just the, the firm's main SIC code. Well, what the heck is that, right? <laughs> you know, it's so uh, that's why I think maybe going from the firm out, it, you know, might be more helpful, but it requires granular data. Is, um, is it better to try with bad data or to just give it up? Oh, uh, we, we use bad data all the time. Um, <laughs> I think we could at least try. <laughs> it's not just in competitive, it's not just in competition. That was a general statement. Uh, this, this is what I'm grappling with is, you know, the data just sort of wouldn't do what we would want it to do, but is it better to try and then, you know, put the caveats on it or is it just to throw up your hands and give up? Uh, I'll, I'll let other people join in, but I think we should do the best we can and get the best data we can and then say, you know, what can we learn from it? Yeah. Christina, if I can just add to Connie's comment there. Uh, again, you know, the answer to your question is obviously, as you know, very, very contingent. It's on the nature of the question and how is our understanding of the question going to be impacted by the specific measurement approach you take. Uh, but one of the ways that, you know, I mean, I, I'll give you a couple of thoughts and maybe some extensions of those will apply because they don't necessarily apply. I mean, I don't know the context in which you're trying to measure competition. But for instance, uh, in many cases, one of the things that I said about, you know, the, the, in my earlier uh, uh, few, you know, uh, statements was that uh, we get to see, you know, and, and this may be only relevant uh, in certain studies of competition, but not others. If you could get onto the digital trace data, say for a company like Amazon, just, you know, I'm, I'm taking one illustration there. And uh, they know, for instance, what did you consider, right? Not just what you bought. And they're also exploiting that information. So now you've got a real mess there because it's not going to be completely, you know, exogenous. It's not like, it's not a good map of the consumer's mind independently. It's an interaction between the consumer's definition of how they're fulfilling their need and Amazon's assessment of what they want the consumer to do. But that may be a possibility. And uh, I know that people have been trying to get some 
you know, stuff out there from, from companies like eBay and Amazon, these marketplaces. So that is one possibility. The other possibility is to track onto a data source. And that's why I think patents are so popular is that they give you an incredible breadth of, uh, you know, uh, or depth, breadth and depth of measurement, but in certain domains, and then you can bring the whole power of algebra into it to really see what ways that you can, you can characterize, you know, positions in technological space and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a huge amount of work there, but when I look at it in some context, I was with something I was doing right now, I, I figured that, that I wasn't happy with any of the stuff and I put my mind to it and you immediately come up with new stuff like that. So, because remember, I mean, I'll just give you an illustration. So the idea here is you're talking about an n-dimensional landscape, whether you're talking about products or technologies, right? It's where n is, is supposedly some large dimension, you know, large number. Uh, notice that each citation in a patent is in a sense uh, a unique dimension, right? It's, we know it is a unique uh, piece of knowledge because otherwise the patent itself would never have been granted, the one that's being cited. And so you can think of a very large n-dimensional space where you do have some idea of, uh, so think of a vector which describes a particular technology, which is the given patent that you have in terms of all past technologies, right? It's giving you, uh, if you treat each of the, uh, of the separate citations as a separate dimension on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on this landscape. And that allows you actually, and then once you've got it in that fashion, you can play around with algebra. Uh, and uh, and see what implications it has because now you have conceptually an n-dimensional space. I'm just giving you one thought on on something like this. Maybe you could do a similar thing with with products, but it's going to be much more difficult. And that's why I think product market competition, which is your core question, I'm not sure how useful this will be. But since I I, I had it in mind, so I'm just laying it out there. I thought I saw Jan Ross's hands up, and I know Dovet has been waving wanting to ask a question, and Tomas also wants to ask a question. All right, so let's start with Jen. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, a, a question that came up when, when it was mentioned that we should probably look more at the demand side, and then it was about willingness to pay, etc. cetera. A question that comes into my mind is like, when are we as competitive strategy researchers in the domain of, of, of marketing or more in that area? I, I remember some of the multi-market competition uh, from uh, Javier Gimeno was published in Journal of Marketing. So, so when are we in that territory and when do we have to feel bad about it? Or should we just leave that open and say, okay, if we look more at the demand side, let's have a look what the marketing folks is doing, willingness to pay, consumers, customers, et cetera, and then bring that into traditional strategy questions. So I feel like um, it's, it's open. Where's our boundary of our interest group here? But that's probably the question here a little bit related to marketing. What are your views here? Uh, I guess I'll break the silence by saying that I actually am quite open to not worrying too much about the boundaries. I'm happy to learn from the marketing people. I, but I know that, and I have had in, enough interaction with marketing people through my uh, 20 odd years of career, because it's interesting that, uh, I, and I presume this is a, a game in every business school, is, uh, you know, when we teach the core, the usually if you've had the misfortune or, or good fortune of having marketing gone before you, they will have tried to cover most of the things we do, okay? And so the student walks in thinking, okay, this is a waste of my time. And they walk out saying, oh man, that was a waste of my time. So, so the point is, neither is a waste of their time. The reality is that they have one perspective because you know, it's amazing how much paradigmatic thinking, even when we are not a, a single paradigm field, does make a difference to how we approach problems. And I think that uh, I have only learned from them and incorporating, I would be shameless in incorporating in my own research if there was a way of measurement that they had come up with. I was just trying to make sure that it actually makes sense for the underlying assumptions of, that I'm making for my research, but I would not hesitate to, uh, to take it on. In fact, I think there's some interesting work that uh, would be done there. And I'm confident that our people, when they work on it, they will come up with ways and because we're coming at it from a slightly different angle, this competitive story angle in competitive advantage with all our background in, in all of that stuff, we'll come up with something that will be useful for the marketing folks as well. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. 
Yes, thank you. This is a very inspiring discussion. I just want to elaborate a bit uh, on a reply to Christina concerning the measurement of product market competition. I uh, witnessed this both uh, as an AE in SMJ, but also as an author, that uh, reviewers are not uh, satisfied anymore with the SIC-based measures of competition. And obviously, these measures had limitations for many years, but now reviewers become impatient. And there are uh, solutions, there are different approaches. I mentioned that some of them in the chat, like uh, Hoberg and Phillips and others, who uh, developed uh, more refined measures based on uh, automated content analysis of uh, terminology that uh, firms uh, use in their 10K forms or other documents. Uh, the approach that I'm using is based on industry experts that uh, develop typologies uh, for specific industries. And then I have expert coders that code the products of uh, each uh, company. But uh, this is uh, really uh, demanding and there are also pros and cons of different approaches, but certainly the SIC is not good enough anymore. So that's uh, just my two cents. Uh, I maybe would add something since I'm somewhat familiar with the Hoberg Phillips uh, data, uh, since they're at my institution. Um, I would say it's, um, it's worth looking into. It has um, some drawbacks from the point of view, the way they did that, it might not quite get at what we are interested in. I'm not sure it's any worse than the SIC codes though. So, it, you know, if we're making a trade off here, you know, it would be more detailed, but uh, you know, I would, I would, it's out there. They want you to use it. Is it, it is another source. I'm not sure it's better, but it's definitely, you know, worth looking at. And I think Deveb is right that what he's doing is fabulous. It's just very you know, labor intensive. So. Tomas, you had a question too. Yes, thank you. So I, I had a question that actually goes back, Connie, to your uh, your somehow um, assessment that maybe you would need more work on the intersection of, of CSR and, and competition. And it's a question about whether and if at all you see somehow any impact of somehow an ongoing reconsideration of what constitutes the, an objective of a firm for how we understand competition and competitive strategy where you know, historically we've mostly talked about value capture um, as an outcome of competition, while in a sense we could see more and more understanding of firm objective as contributing to value creation rather than, than capture and how that, how competitive strategy can deal with that. Well, I mean the essential, one of the essential insights of the value-based strategy is that you can't capture without creating, you know, except under some really unique situations. So, you, ha you know, so I think your point is, is correct. You have to think about creation, right? If, you know, and that they go together. Uh, so yeah, that, that's completely right on. I, I actually quite interested in the CSR. I think I saw one or two papers come across my radar screen of all the flow I see. It's trying to think about how, uh, competition with CSR. You know, that if it's an important thing that consumers care about, for example, Right, to go back to the demand side, you would think that your CSR moves would have competitive effects. And so that was part of what I was thinking. I actually have a suggestion for, uh, you know, PK and the uh, uh, CSI I group uh, in the following sense that, uh, you know, uh, Christina's question is, raises some very important question, issues that if you think about it, measuring a product market competition should be like kind of, you know, like it's the foundation stone of anything else that you would do in, in competitive strategy, right? And uh, I was reminded that actually Connie had, had this, done this incredibly institutional service of assembling these data sets from a variety of sources and putting them together and making them available to, to all of us. Uh, one of our many institutional services, for those of you that are familiar with the uh, the Dartmouth conference, you would, you would see that, that you know, that's another one. But here the issue is, uh, there's a huge amount of fixed cost required. See, what uh, Dovev is doing is amazing, right? But to imagine that you would do that for everything, now I can imagine Dovev doing that for everything. He is that, you know, uh, devoted and dedicated. But uh, think of how the NBER patent data set really sort of set on fire the technology space, right? because we don't have to deal with all the random stuff that has to be done to clean it up. 
So maybe along the lines that Connie had done earlier, you could have a, you know, maybe the CSIG group and, uh, you know, SMS is a lot of money, uh, could actually seed something which uh, builds a database of this kind, but on the product market side, you know, and, and it could be a project of some kind and, you know, maybe the journals could get involved in terms of, you know, there's publications there just for how you built the data set and what, what are the characteristics of the data set. And different people have different skills in the field. And so some people could kind of push towards that. And, uh, and I think that uh, SMS is well positioned uh, to kind of, you know, uh, take that kind of initiative. So it is a thing that's fundamentally been a blockage in our way, but uh, maybe that's one of the things. Now it won't work for everything, but at least somewhere we will have made a contribution and who knows, this is my, this might be something that even the economists might like, and you know, that, you know, it's another way of getting influenced more broadly in, in, uh, in academia. All right, on that note, we are uh, out of time. So thank you so much, Gautam and Connie for the very insightful conversations. Uh, there's no reason to stop these conversations, right? So feel free to uh, carry on with discussions offline. And we hope, we really hope that this session has been helpful to our members and that adds value to the members. And if so, that's something that we can uh, continue to do in the, in the years to come. Right? So thank you so much for coming, uh, all of you. And congratulations once again to the uh, winners and the finalists of our uh, Best Proposal Awards. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, and thank you guys for organizing this, Jad and PK and Tomas. This is really fun. So, thank you. Thank you for coming. All right. Okay, you guys. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>